2018, Google's collaboration with the Department of Defense in Project Maven made thousands of Google employees protest. Project Maven is a Pentagon project that uses artificial intelligence to analyze drone footage to detect people and objects. Google employees said it was wrong to build technologies for military surveillance with potentially lethal outcomes. They wrote an open letter to the CEO demanding Google cancel the project and construct a clear policy against building warfare technology. Thousands signed the petition and some even resigned. They wanted Google, the company with the motto, don't be evil, to do the right thing. Google announced that it will not continue Project Maven. It also published its AI principles to outline where the company stands on ethical AI. So Google employees won. Or so it seemed. Unfortunately, Google's AI principles only made general and vague claims. So they stated that um, they will not build AI, AI systems for technologies whose principal purpose or implementation is to cause or directly facilitate injury to people. So worthy but great. But they also explicitly stated that they will continue working with the military and the governments in many other areas, including search and rescue. So you realize um, this does not rule out Google's work in Project Maven because the same technology that analyzes drone footage can be used for targeting or for search and rescue. So they only needed to revert the project's purpose to fit Maven into their AI principles. In fact, Google's AI principles are vague to the point of being meaningless. For example, for accountability and safety, they say that they will design AI systems to be appropriately cautious, they will test and monitor them in appropriate cases, and they will subject them to appropriate human control. So depending on how you define appropriate, these principles can mean anything, right? <laughs> but this problem of vagueness does not only lie in Google's response. It also lies with the employees' demands. Remember they said um, Google should, should not build warfare technology to assist US government in military surveillance. Did this meant to over, overrule all military surveillance, even if the goal is to save lives? Did they disagree with the methods or the goals of the US military, or were they worried about potential abuses? Their position had to be clearly justified to, to be effective. Instead, their vague arguments allowed Google's vague response. The Maven saga is a good illustration of what has been happening in the tech industry at large. So by now, we all know that AI raises serious ethical concerns, even, even scandals. We've seen how um, filter bubbles manipulate our decisions in political votes or in vaccinating our children, how algorithmic biases reinforce discrimination by automatically disqualifying women for high-powered jobs or by rating certain minorities as high risk, so just to name a few. But what is not yet clear is how to deal with these questions how to evaluate value trade-offs and determine the right actions to take in building and implementing AI systems. A major setback for this has been a combination of ethics washing and ethics policing. So what Google did in Maven is ethics washing. That is using the ethics language and giving the appearance of doing ethics, in part to avoid ethics policing. So when practitioners think about ethics, they immediately think about regulation and uh, oversight and compliance, some authority telling them what they can and cannot do. So in order to avoid, no one likes being police, so in order to avoid that, they often pretend to tackle ethical issues just by <coughs> mentioning ethics repeatedly. <laughs> In fact, this bizarre dynamic between ethics washing and ethics policing um, resulted in about 90 sets of AI principles in the last two years, published by private companies, international organizations, governmental agencies, without much clarity of how to use them. In comparison, we've been using a single set of core principles for biomedical ethics for over 40 years. And Organizations also put together ethics boards whose function is yet to be 
defined. All of these make companies look good, but they don't help them solve ethical problems. If Project Maven sounds too removed from our lives, let's, let's take another example. Um, out of your pockets, mobile phones. So our, we keep our phones with us at all times, almost like an extension of ourselves. So this, of course, creates potential for abuses, unethical uses. Um, think about how your phone works. Your phone tracks you in many ways. Uh, most apps continue to collect your data and communicate it with third parties. Features like personalization run on this data. So, for example, you book a flight to Las Vegas on your, on your travel app. And the app also suggests hotels to you. Um, that's great, that's very useful. But then the, these hotel ads keep popping up everywhere on every browser. And then you start getting ads for casinos, offers for online gambling, um, persistently, right? That creates this information that is gathered about you. So companies use this information to know you better and to build um, products that are efficient and convenient for you. But they also use this, the same information, the, the data that they gather about you, to build more addictive products for you to target your vulnerabilities, and to define the set of options that you get to see, even profiling your children. So the data that you produce is often used to benefit other actors in, at the expense of your autonomy, your well-being, and your fair treatment. And as many other gadgets become smart, these problems only get bigger. So how can we build ethical technologies? Let's say we are building an app with the personalization feature, and we want to make sure that it is not going to raise ethical problems. So we would start by identifying all the ways that this product might um, obstruct individual decision making, harm users, or uh, make certain groups worse off. So the decisions, will, and we would address these questions as we build the app. So the decisions would include what data to collect and um, share, which features to build in so that user agency is not sacrificed for convenience, and how to communicate important information to get meaningful user consent, instead of pretending that a click on terms and conditions page means something. <laughs> So realize that these problems are not um, about compliance to set a set of principles or rules. So I mean, good luck solving them with generic taglines like be socially responsible. Rather, they are puzzles to be solved. And precisely for that reason, we need to move from the mindset of policing in ethics to puzzle solving in ethics. And they are very particular types of uh, puzzles. They are centered around what it, the, the key concerns are what is good and what is just. So these, around these key concerns of autonomy, well-being, fairness. Luckily, there is a discipline that's been around for over two millennia dealing with exactly these questions. Philosophy. <laughs> so you might think of philosophy as abstract debates among ancient men in robes or in smoke-filled cafes, <laughs> but there's more than that. So we've been using philosophy in policymaking, in public health, within hospitals, within labs. Philosophers, particularly moral and political philosophers, are trained to recognize problems related to fairness and, and good. Um, they are they are trained for asking the hard questions, the uncomfortable questions, and finding answers. So if we want to solve these, ethic, solve these questions in ethics of AI, we have to place AI ethics where it naturally sits, within applied philosophy, and approach it like philosophers do, using systematic, analytic reasoning, drawing from this huge body of knowledge of two millennia, <laughs> and guiding us to make ethical decisions in building and implementing AI systems. So now you might think 
that this will never work because we need regulations if we want companies to do the right thing and still be able to compete in the market. And you are absolutely right. We definitely need regulations to set the boundaries and clarify what is unacceptable. But we cannot bypass ethics for two reasons. One, if we want companies to do the right thing, we first have to figure out what that right thing is. And that is an ethics question. And two, regulations by their nature cannot be very detailed. They cannot answer every question that the practitioners face all the time. So we need regulations for the big picture. In fact, we need global rules, but we also need ethics for the details. So yes, ethics is not the only thing we need to develop ethical AI, but it is something we simply cannot skip over. How do we then go about implementing this system, this puzzle solving in ethics? So we need technology experts and ethics experts collaborate throughout all phases of building and implementing AI systems. So that is research, development, design, deployment, even updating. And we can get this by training developers and researchers, by having philosophers uh, analyze and help solve complex ethical problems, and by uh, constructing ethics strategies for the companies. So now, with these three steps in mind, let's go back all the way back to the very beginning of the Maven saga and imagine how things could have played out differently. So first, it's 2017 now. Google is considering taking on the Maven. That's their first call for ethics. Bring in the philosophers to ethically analyze the project. It's not easy because such an analysis has to involve questions around core questions of AI and military ethics. Data collection, military surveillance, mitigation of harm, dual use of technology. Not easy, but ethics experts can lay out the ethical choices at hand. In fact, once the project is on the table, there is no escape from ethics analysis because any decision, even the decision to pass on Maven, is an ethically loaded one. So we don't know exactly what has happened in these initial stages, but we do know that when asked, Google could not ethically, ju justi ethically justify its reason for taking on Maven. And next, Google employees find out about the project. They, are, they feel uncomfortable and then outraged. So that's the second call for ethics. While developers and engineers are perfectly, in fact, uniquely placed to flag ethical concerns, they are not trained to deal with them. They don't have the right tools. If they had, they would have constructed strong analytic arguments for why and to what extent they find Maven ethically problematic and how this relates to other military projects. OK, so Google employees did not have watertight arguments. Still, Google has to respond and decides to discontinue Maven and draft AI principles. That's their third call for ethics. Um, that is the perfect time to craft an action-guiding operational ethics strategy, drawing from applied philosophy to, uh, with clear definitions, priorities, and processes for implementation. So if these obvious opportunities had not been missed, Google and Google employees by now would have a system to judge the next sensitive project. And customers, be it the uh, armed forces or the governmental agencies, would know what collaborative options are available and what work needs to be done on their side to avoid backlash. You might think that these tech giants have the world's best minds in the room, so they don't need philosophers. <laughs> but realize <laughs> that no one in the room is tasked to develop solutions for these complex ethical problems. And um, even the tech geniuses with the best intentions don't have the expertise to engage with this particular body of knowledge from this particular discipline. OK, so now you might be thinking, you must be thinking, that <laughs> I really dislike Google. Because I could have chosen any company, and I kept picking on this one. <laughs> well, actually, Google makes a good example because its culture originally allowed, even encouraged, ethical concerns to be voiced and pursued. 
So this culture made Google employees protest. And this culture made Google respond, even if inadequately. And that, having such a culture, is the necessary foundation for this organizational ethics system that I describe. The tech world may still choose to ignore ethics, thinking that it is not in their business interest. But that's a short-sighted view. Ignoring ethics is, at best, a high-stakes gamble. By, by not addressing ethical issues seriously and substantively, companies are gambling with user trust and encouraging punitive regulations. So with every ethics scandal they cause, they make the public and the policymakers think that they are reckless entities to be controlled. And as a result, hastening reactive regulations that will limit their own space for innovation. And that's not just bad for businesses, that's bad for the society. Because we benefit from thriving and responsible innovation. So companies now think that they are doing well in ethics if they add fairness, accountability, AI for good to their vocabulary. But that's just not enough. Taking ethics seriously means that every stakeholder will do their part to, to ensure that ethical concerns are not neglected. Software developers should demand tools for identifying, flagging, and solving ethical problems before they become um, systematic issues for their organizations. Corporate executives must integrate applied ethics into their um, organizational culture and business operations by collaborating with ethics experts. And institutional investors should require companies to demonstrate that they can proactively address and solve ethical problems. As a society, we have no other reasonable choice but to take AI ethics more seriously. AI is being incorporated into every aspect of our personal and professional lives, and it will define our future, and it will define our society going forward. So if we want to retain our agency and live in a fair world, we have to tackle AI ethics head on. And for that, there is no better tool than philosophy. Thank you.